Hey, greetings everybody, it's Gleecon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft coming at ya. Uh, on our last episode, we finished off Westfall, uh, more or less. There is the Deadfall, Deadmines dungeon we're going to have to do in there. And a couple quests, I think, kind of in Moonbrook, right outside that dungeon that originate in, um, whatchamacallit, in the Stone Red Ridge Mountains. Um, so yeah, I'll have to kind of take a peek at that. I do think Dead Mines is our next big dungeon that we're going to do. So I'll do a little research about when. Kind of feels like around level 20-ish is when we're going to try to bust that one out. Um, so we got a little bit of time. We're going to pretty much finish all of our zones first. Um, but we did finish Westfall. We did some light, light, uh, lighthouse quests and we ran around and just basically killed. Did okay. We need a new weapon for the Paladin, but we did okay. All right, we've also been reading the Horde Player's Guide, and we're going to finish it today. Last time we looked at uh, some beast area, it was really kind of underwhelming um, fluff material to fill out that book. Uh, and stay a while and listen as we finish the book with Chapter 10. This is going to give us, I don't know, two or three adventures. Let's find out. So the first adventure, and if you recall on some of the other Dungeons & Dragons episodes, they've given us um, some like campaign one-offs. And once or twice they've done that, maybe more, maybe three times. Not too many, not in every book, but it's not. this is not our first time. So we're going to glance, just kind of bruise through. This, is, this would be about 20 pages, but we're going to move at a fast clip. So it begins with Shrine of the Scarab. It's an eighth level party of four. That's typical. Um, it says it's a good idea to have a shaman or a witch doctor. So we want some kind of nature-based divine magic it's in the barrens involves centaur animals and undead so we're going to read the background and just kind of glance through among the beliefs of the small krenka centaur tribe is that every animal in the barrens has a guiding spirit that controls its actions and destiny by venerating a guiding spirit a tribe can gain the blessing of that guiding spirit although similar ideas appear in many tribal cultures the krenka take this to extremes going so far as to construct elaborate idols and following various ceremonies aimed at pleasing the Baron's spirits. The Krenka have not been doing well of late. Rival centaur clans slowly gobble up Krenka lands, and recent raids against Orc, Tauren, and Harpies have been poor at best. Surely a spirit must be displeased, but which one? And what must be done to placate it? Seeking the answers, the Krenka shaman have spent the last month performing rituals, ceremonies, and meditations, often with the use of mind-altering magic and substances. One such shaman, Forgold, recently saw through a haze of hallucination a vision of a scarab beetle scuttling into a cavernous chamber somewhere underground. Within this cave, a pyramid of stones rises out of a natural pool surrounded by four ornate pillars. In the vision, the beetle crawls into the pile of stones, which follow away to reveal a skeletal centaur dressed in a regal array of high-quality animal skins. In one hand, the skeleton wields a long spear that glows with a bluish light. Forgol believes that this vision shows the final resting place of Krenka himself, founder of his tribe. According to ancient tales, when Krenka grew old, he wandered out into the barrens to die, but promised to return to aid his people if the need was great. To this day, following his example, those centaur who grow too old or injured to fight leave the tribe to die alone, their fates never known by their people. Forgol thinks that the scarab spirit has given him an explicit instructions to find Krenka's remains and bring them back to the tribe. The spear's glow indicates it is a powerful weapon meant for the chieftain. Furthermore, as the follower of one of the lesser baron's creatures, the beetle, Forgol thinks that succeeding in this challenge will prove his worth and move both him and his totem spirit up in the hierarchy. To this end, he has gathered a group of followers and set off to locate Krenka's tomb. To aid him in this task, Forgol spent the last week constructing a totem to guide him through his vision. This totem takes the form of a finely carved staff tipped with a black chunk of obsidian in the shape of a scarab. When this talisman was complete, Forgold jammed it into the ground. Immediately, a large scarab beetle crawled from the hole and set off across the barrens. Forgold and his escorts now followed the slow-moving creature toward its destination, a hidden side entrance to the Wailing Caverns. Okay, cool. So, the adventure begins with the heroes encountering this centaur band and the scarab, and they decide to follow it and go into the Wailing Caverns. Um, deep within, they will find Krenka, but he's misunderstood it. These remains have been corrupted and he can't escape unless the remains are taken out. So he's not here to help his tribe. The tribe needs to help him. 
So this starts in the northern barrens, just not at crossroads. Um, and they just give some hooks of how you could encounter that particular tribe if you don't already have a good reason to go to the Wailing Caverns. Here's a cool picture of them. Centaur and the Beetle, this is an encounter level that we'll have. So this is kind of the initial. It's an encounter level, but not necessarily combat. So let's read what the heroes would have, would, would hear. The rocky terrain of the barren stretches ahead of you. Above a hawk circles in the bright sunlight, seeking small prey for a midday meal. In the distance, a dark shape that might be a Kodo beast meanders across the plains. The wind gusts occasionally, whipping clouds of dust about your group. Then you hear it carried along with the breeze, hoofbeats. Even as you reach for your weapons, a small troop of centaur, bronzed bodies decorated with garish blue tattoos, emerges from behind a ridge. They seem to be following something small and black on the ground before them. Even as you try to figure out what that might be, the centaur spot you. So it says that uh, this could happen day or night. You might spot them. If not, they're going to overcome you. You could potentially make this into a uh, negotiation type of like fast talking sort of mission, which is fun. I actually find that when I play, the people that I play with have just as much fun with that sort of thing as they do with combat. Um, but otherwise, they're going to ambush the party. And throughout the battle, you have to also, as the DM, be keeping track of what's happening with the beetle. So there are four hunters, two warriors, and uh, Forgol himself, a powerful shaman. And they give the stat blocks for all of them. He will, of course, uh, um, buff his people. So after they fight the centaur, if they have to, they... The heroes have to decide to follow the scarab. If they don't, boom, adventure over. So somehow as a DM, you've got to provoke them uh, to follow that beetle. Um, on the surface, there might be little reason for it, but they might just be curious. If not, they could have some other motivations. They could get Forgol staff, and that could kind of prompt them. Um, a different friendly tribe of centaur could kind of prompt them. So this is, yeah, they basically just give more reasons. Um, they could, in other investigations, be hooked in to this centaur mission, um, or other Krenka could attack and therefore kind of drive the mission in that direction. But the beetle never stops moving. So eventually it's going to take them to the Wailing Cavern, where the side entrance will lead into the Kowatl Cave, which is the next thing we'll read. You follow your beetle guides that makes a beeline directly toward the side of a rocky hill ahead. The creature climbs toward a large stone embedded in the slope, just as you think it will continue on. However, the insect comes to a halt and digs into the earth. Before you can do anything to stop it, the scarab disappears into the ground, leaving nothing but dirt in its wake. So they can they, the party will then find this entrance into the side cave, and um, it's actually be, being a layer of a deviate koala. If you remember, the deviates are the beasts that are around Wailing Caverns, but you'd have to remember that from your own playthrough because we haven't quite got there yet. We haven't quite got to the Wailing Caverns yet. Um, the, the Let's see, they could try to use strength to move the stone. Um, and if they get it right away, they could try to fight the Coatl. They could surprise it, but more than likely, this is going to be an even fight versus the Coatl. Okay. After that fight, they've now gained entrance into the Wailing Caverns. They kind of describe it, what it looks like. Uh, there are random encounters that you go throughout. Dire Rats, Deep Elementals, Mana Surges, and One Man. Ice Revenants, or Rock Borers. Okay, so those are the different types. There are also Deviant Creatures, and they kind of give you um, what they gain. They gain a spell-like ability. For example... Um, they, yeah, so it's up to the DM's discretion, basically, but each Deviate gains one spell-like ability. Encounters. Uh, so once you get into the dungeon, the first area is that Kowatl there, which says, With the stone moved aside, you see a natural cavern ahead. This area is about 40 feet across and made of smooth rock. To your left, you see a large collection of sticks and straw held together with dried mud. Ahead, your eyes catch the glimmer of water along the far wall. To your right, a pile of skeletons and corpses attracts your attention. The smell of carrion, a sultry nose is causing the bile to rise in your throats. Um, and basically, you're going to have to fight the Kowatl, and there's no tribe of the guide, uh, no guide, no sign of the scarab guide. This is the map. So there's only, there's eight areas. 
the second area looks like it's a tunnel system. So after you fight him, and then there's a left would be three, right would be four, five would be another tunnel system, six is another cave, and then seven and eight looks like it's kind of mandatory to get through there. So two is the tunnel junction. Squeezing through the tiny passageway for perhaps 20 feet, you emerge into a wider area. Water sloshes about your feet as you take your bearings. The tunnel continues eastward, expanding to about five feet wide in all directions. The water seems to be flowing in that same direction, but slowly. Bluish light emanating from the moist walls illuminates the passageway in an eerie glow. The sound of dripping is constant. So nothing big here, but there is there are lightning traps set around by a gnomish explorer. So that's your only real thing. If you go to the left or to the north, this is an ooze pit. The corridor ahead narrows before opening into a larger chamber. Squeezing through the tiny opening, you emerge into a beautiful natural cavern. Three columns of limestone flow from the ceiling to the ground in what looks like a frozen waterfall. Growths of crystal and gypsum sparkle in the faint blue light. Between the columns, water drips into a black pool about 15 feet across. Light wisps of smoke, possibly steam, rise up from this pool. And as you watch, an occasional bubble rises to the surface and pops with a soft hiss. So in the pool, um, I'm guessing, yeah, is a black ooze. Along the wall is uh, gypsum. You could try to carve some off. But the black ooze, anybody that gets too close, the black ooze will come out and you'll have to fight it. And it's a deviant black ooze, probably. Um, I'm not sure. Actually, I don't know. It doesn't really say, but I thought it said somewhere something about a deviant black ooze. Yeah. Oh, it is. Okay. It's a deviant black ooze. And its power is that it can hold monster. What was the uh, coattles deviant? It can use the dimension door to get through the wall of its cave, uh, to get through the blocked stones that were blocking in the cave. Okay, area four is the rat layer. So if you went on the right side or to the south, the passageway widens as you climb slightly upward, leaving the waterlogged tunnel behind. Ahead, a natural cavern widens into a larger chamber. Stalagmites and fallen rocks litter the floor, creating a broken, jumbled mess of obstructions. Somewhere amid these, near the far side of the room, a yellowish glow stands out amid the normal blue light. The stench of rotting matter fills the air. Endless dripping continues, but between drops you hear something else, a faint scratching coming from deeper in. So this floor has dozens of tiny um, tiny tunnels hidden amidst bones. So you have it says you have to be careful and it's very hard to sneak through. There is a trap. It's a rotted back backpack um, that will burst off a sonic burst. It's a sonic trap, basically. Um, and there are tons of rat swarms that will come out and there are dire rat swarms and they cast lesser immolate so kind of weak still um there is a gold magister's rod in that trapped treasure that has the sonic like boom trap in it okay so there's a secret tunnel entrance in area five this is the second set of tunnels if you look here that I'm guessing leads us to the real thing that we need where the where the heroes want to go. The narrow passage here dips down, leaving only a tiny air pocket overhead for breathing. Even as you carefully move forward, you can tell you're going to have to go completely underwater to proceed. That's kind of cool. That's a throwback to a lot of classic type dungeons. Um, so there is, it says, an advanced greater deep elemental in here. And you're going to have to fight it. I don't know. Oh, the secret door is a rusted grating. Okay, so you pretty much would have to. You you just have to get close to it. It's not really a secret door, except that you're going to have to go underwater and fight the greater deep elements to get there. Okay, the area six that is not through the secret door is Teenix's resting place. This chamber is a wide and spacious natural cave. The water gets deeper ahead, then ends about halfway across the room. Beyond that, stalagmites dot the floor, coated in a dark blue moss. Several fallen stalactites lay strewn about. A portion of the far wall appears to have collapsed inward, creating a pile of loose stones and rubble. Just visible there amid the fallen rocks, something small twitches in the shadow. That's the scarab guide. Um, so it's a big room full of rubble, and there is a trap. It's a spore trap in there. So you have to be careful. The corpse is a gnomish archimist. He's buried within all of the rubble. He's had noggin fog or elixir. Um, so there's a, it seems like the scurbs leading to this body, but this is just sort of a coincidence. 
Um, the spore trap will poison them with fatigue. Um, and there's a pack of deep water in here that is full of deviant frenzies. They cast reduced person. They are the reason why the guy looks like he's had the noggin fog or elixir because he's been shrunk. Um, but he does have doses of noggin fog or elixir and some strong bracers of armor plus four. Nice. Some diamonds and an amulet of health. Okay, now if you go through the secret grate by the water elemental, you will find the waterlogged grotto. A tunnel makes a sharp turn and widens into a murky dark chamber about 50 feet across. Several flattened columns rise up from the bottom carved into beautiful swirling patterns. A natural current seems to pull the water into the center of the chamber, chamber drawing it toward a black spot on the floor. Um, not a lot other than the fact that if you go back, like this is where you need to go through. But there's really not, except that there is a secret door at the back. So otherwise, this just kind of would seem like an empty room. It's not strong enough. The water's not really a hazard. No monsters are in here. Um, you just would have to see that the stones, if you really got a good search check, you could pull out a stone at the front and then find the tomb of Krenka. This narrow passage rises at a slight angle as you walk. The air is musty and stale. Ahead, the corridor takes a sudden turn. The wall to the left appears to be blocked by a rock fall, while the right-hand side opens up into a wide natural cave. Around the corner, a pyramid of stones rises out of a pool surrounded by four ornate pillars. Atop each pillar is a carved image of a creature, a kodo, a serpent, a lion, and a scarab. The water in the pool encircles the stone pyramid like a moat. Okay, he will rise because he's corrupted and you'll have to fight him. He is a risen centaur warrior. And after you have defeated him... Um, if they destroy his corpse, they realize that that is one way to have set him free. They can leave and say nothing, or they can go back and tell the centaur. Um, they might be mad for killing Forgol, but if you, all, I'm sure if you tell them you helped them out, they'll be fine. And this could, this adventure could then lead to others. With the centaur, um, it could create a positive reputation with the Krenka. You could, something could happen with the rod you found, or yada, yada, yada. Okay, so, whatever. It's okay. My guess is this is just two adventures, and the other one, the second one, I don't think we have time, we have room for three adventures. So I'm guessing this is just two. The second one's called Unearthing Baelmodan. This is designed for four level two, so this is a low level one. It's cool. Um, this takes place in Baelmodan, which is in the Barrens. And here's the background. Over 100,000 years ago, beings known as Titans built great libraries, workshops, and laboratories throughout Azeroth. Baelmodon was one such site. The Titans encrypted their research on banded platinum disks in a runic language now forgotten to mortal races. The site at Baelmodon served the Titans as a storage facility for these disks before they packed up most of their gear and left. A few guardians remained to protect the site for eternity, and the Titans sealed off the main entrance. Geological forces worked over the millennia to sink the Titan ruins deeper and deeper under a mountain. Earthquakes and shifting ground broke the ruins into several large areas and separated them, sometimes hundreds of feet apart. Natural tunnels and caves developed around the ruins as erosion and time took their toll. The area is now a great wilderness inhabited by fierce creatures, including the mighty Kolkar Centaur tribe. A year ago, Trogs escaped hibernation chambers deep underground after an earthquake broke open some of their hibernation chambers when you use that like a phrase twice in the same sentence the strongest of the tro trogs a hideous creature named Angerlock, leads this band the trogs now dwell in the caves above the ruins where they have easy access to food and water okay so the heroes are moving along the gold road they might notice that Baelmadon is smoking and then they can come and investigate and find the remains of a dwarf archaeologist and a map indicating how to get to this particular site um if they go beneath the earth, they'll find a cool hall protected by Acherus the Custodian, and they'll find unused trog hibernation chambers. That's cool. All right, so some things for the heroes. Most likely hooks. So merchants from Ratchet could hire them. They could have popped out, and they'll just see this on their way between Thousand Needles and Theramore Isle. Um, they might be newly recruited soldiers of the Horde patrolling and find it. They might have inherited the old map that you would otherwise find on the dead guy. Concerned Horde citizens could hire them and send them out in that direction. A renegade Dwarf could hire them um, to travel to caves he believes where they can be discovered. But he might actually not be a, a renegade but an Alliance spy. And if they're part of the Alliance, he 
which why are we reading the Horde Player's Guide then? But okay. Um, he, they could just straight up be hired uh, to find this missing dwarf or whatever. So, when the adventure begins, this is what will be read. The road continues to twist and turn through the rocky terrain. In the distance, a thin pillar of smoke winds lazily in the air. It's too small to be anything more than a simple campfire and comes from over a ridge to the north a few thousand feet away. And that will give us our wilderness camp, which says, The body of a dwarf holding a pistol lies beside a dying fire. A wolf-like beast stands close to the half-eaten dwarf corpse, its muzzle red with blood. A closer look at the creature reveals two bloody wounds on its coarse black pelt. And you'll be fighting a wounded warg. Great, which is why you can do it as a level two party. Um, there's also centaur tribal markers. As you're moving along, a carved wooden totem about eight feet tall and six inches in diameter rises from the dirt ground. It has an arrowhead shaped cross piece from which hang symbols inside of circles bound out of wrapped sticks. Um, these are just totems to mark the centaur tribe, that this is centaur tribe territory where you're at. Um, and you might encounter a centaur route scout so shortly after they leave the camp they are going to encounter or be spotted by a scout um if they catch up to the scout so this could go either way you could try they're not going to want to have diplomacy you might have to fight them um they just want to kind of sh shoot at them from behind cover okay approaching the trog cave says a hideous creature moves through a cluster of trees some distance ahead it's powerfully built with a thick forehead and a jutting lower jaw it walks hunched over and drags a bone club after a few yards the beast disappears inside a dark cave entrance which takes us to the Vale Modan entrance this is 11 sections in the dungeon there is a wandering patrol of five trogs that could happen in any particular area uh split in half or whatever so they, you basically, they are the only random wandering monsters, which is just because this is such a low-level adventure. Cool dampness. This is at the cave entrance. One. Cool dampness greets you, as does a moldy smell that permeates the air of this natural formation. From inside comes the sound of dripping water. Several yards into the cave, a large column of natural stone splits the passage in two sections. So you can go to the left or to the right. To the right would be a camouflage pit trap, and you just walk and... The trogs have covered it, so you might fall in it or not. And if you go to the left, you'll find the guard chamber. Broken bones and tiny fragments of rotting flesh lie scattered about this chamber where two trogs are on guard. And um, basically, they'll just you're just fighting them. Continue deeper in, and you'll reach a stream. A three-foot-wide, one-foot-deep stream of water flows in this tunnel, disappearing into a hole at the base of the north wall. A large quantity of phosphorescent moss grows along the stream and the cave walls. Now, if you look here... Down the cliff, it looks like maybe down a cliff side you could enter area five. Or if you stayed to the right going straight, you would enter area seven. So, um, yeah, there is an actual corridor. Oh, it ascends. Okay, so this is actually a climb up, it looks like. And this is a steep walk down that direction. So if you climb up, you'll be in the kitchen area five. This chamber is stocked with provisions and firewood. Animal carcasses lie in an alcove to the west while boxes, sacks, and firewood are stocked in an alcove to the north. A trog tends to a spit over a fire in the center of the cave. The smoke from the fire rises to a tiny opening in the 40-foot high ceiling. This might be the fire that we saw before. The creature's name is Markalog, and he tries to flee. So if he flees, I would imagine things are going to be bad um, and more trogs will come. It, it says he will go two trogs that are posted in area six will come fight so okay not much not a lot of things but there's provisions and stuff that you can find in there so then if you go to area six that's the deep chasm a shelf hangs over the edge of a deep chasm the ceiling looms high above in darkness and the bottom can't be seen over the edge of the chasm the sound of a waterfall from below echoes throughout the chamber and a faint mist of water vapor permeates the air a narrow ledge runs north along the west wall bends and heads back south along the east wall at the bottom of the cave. So before we find out where that goes, we'll look at the areas seven and eight. Um, but basically just don't fall in that pit and you'll be okay. It does say if you fight around this pit because it's gonna be harder and more dangerous, you get more XP. So area seven, the path down to area eight is just called stalagmites. This section of cave tunnel is thick with stalactites and stalagmites. Many of them have merged over the years to create eight foot tall pillars and all are coated with the same phosphorescent moss that 
runs the length of the brook. Despite the forest of stone, a clear split in the tunnel is obvious. One fork continues along with the stream, the other heads south. Area 8 is the spider cave. The cave becomes, so this is actually getting stronger, this is encounter level 3. The cave becomes gradually larger, and there are many nooks and crannies along the walls and ceiling far to the southwest. Cobwebs cover the walls and ceiling. There are two large mounds of webbing upon the floor in the southeast portion of the cave. So, you'll be fighting a monstrous, big monstrous, a medium one, a medium monstrous spider with three small ones. Um, it's because the mom's trying to protect its babies, basically. And if you can defeat them inside the the wrapped things, one is a dead trog, but the other is a, a night elf who has masterwork moon glives. That's cool. Gloves of agility, potions of cure light wounds, potion of roar. So a pretty decked out hero. All right, now back to the other path, um, which either one could take you this way. So the paths rejoin now at nine before opening up into 10. Nine is a pool. Delicate phosphorescent moss covers the entire chamber, which has obviously not been entered in months. Along the northwest wall, about 10 feet up from the floor, it's a tiny hole with clear water rushing out. The water falls in a three foot deep pool that flows away via stream heading west out of the chamber. You can kind of see that. And that's it. 11 takes us out past the wall. So let's read 10, which is before those gates and then 11. 10 is the living chamber. It's a, this is a level four encounter. The floor of this chamber slopes gently upward toward the east. The rough natural ceiling is at least 60 feet high, and the far eastern wall appears to be an immense fortification half buried in solid rock. Its open gate is 35 feet tall. The gate wall is 80 feet wide and flanked by two towers that stretch from the cave floor and bury themselves in the ceiling. Several trogs lie upon animal skins strewn about the rocky floor. So this is the, the entrance to a fortress that used to stand down here 100,000 years ago. Now it's mostly ruins that are underground. There are 50, oh, there originally were 54 trogs, but they've suffered many losses. There are 18 left. Six of them are out hunting. Five of them, so that leaves 12. Five of them are the wandering monsters, at least seven. And then you had two, two, the cook, Angerlock, and there are three. But those three are the three that are out here right now. Okay, so you'd have to fight these trogs that grab their clubs. And then anger lock. This is boss fight time. So after a couple, after a round or two, anger lock will rush out. And he's a shaman. He'll use spells. Okay. And that would, of course, clear the way for the chieftain's quarters. More of the fortress walls are visible here. And the chamber appears to be the ruins of an age long gone. Were not for the cave ceiling, one might think this place should be outside to defend some important trade route. Further to the east is a fissure in the cavern floor where the rest of the fortress should be. Stacked against the north wall is a massive mound of animal furs that serves as a bed. Freshly gnawed animal bones lie scattered beneath it. Um, so the fissure is deep. Uh, you might get stuck in it and have to, to have climb your way out and to give DCs for that. And there's the stat block for the anger lock shaman. Oh, there's the second half of the map. That's why I was going to say that seems like a weird spot to end. So this actually goes up to 16. Um, but yeah, you could beat him either way. And then that you would be at the foot of the fissure, area 12. A massive set of arched double doors is set directly into the east wall of this natural cavern. One of the doors is slightly ajar. The faint light from the chamber beyond spills out into the caves. Cool. They're open just enough to squeeze through, in which case you'd enter the Titan Grand Hall. Over 100 feet in diameter, this circular dome chamber is almost too beautiful to be real. The walls are composed of yellowish gray stone with green accents and pillars are set into alcoves, giving this grand hall an overall regal appearance. Along the dome ceiling, some 70 feet above, translucent tiles glow with a soft light from an unknown source. The hall includes three other pairs of arched double doors like the one in the western wall, spaced evenly about the chamber. The one set to the north is slightly ajar, but the other doors are closed. In the center of the chamber is a wide two-foot-high pedestal upon which a stone statue stands. Bright green crystals cover the humanoid-shaped statue's left forearm. The bony remains of several creatures lie around the chamber. Okay, so it's just trog skeletons. Um, the statue is a statue of Acherus. Uh, what about him? I guess that's what we're seeing right there. One round after they enter, he starts speaking in the Titan language until he realizes they can only, they can't speak it and they have to um, speak. 
uh, he'll he'll adjust these stones on his forearm, which lets him basically speak common. And he says, I'm Akras, the custodian. Please state your intentions for entering this facility. Um, he is an assistant. And actually, if you think about the caretakers from Shadowlands in Zareth Mortis, kind of takes us back to that type of uh, area. He's been here as an information assistant from 100,000 years ago when it was still in operation. He doesn't allow anyone to search the chamber. They can leave. They can talk. Um, he has a, ma a master titan named Kazgaroth. Do we know Kazgaroth? Can't remember if that was mentioned. He's one of the titans that we've talked about. I would imagine he would. Um, he left. They left a hundred thousand years ago. He don't know where. He doesn't know where they went. He's awaiting the return. It used to be a multi-level complex. An earthquake damber, dam damaged the hibernation chambers uh, and let the trogs out. He knows that the Titan scientists referred to the successful second race experiment as Series Two which I guess would be the creation of Earthen and there then into dwarves after that. He, but this guy does not recognize dwarves because they're not Earthen. Um, to the south is the library chamber, but it is severely damaged. And further to the east is a cave-in. He has strict orders. They cannot bluff him. Um, so basically, you're not allowed into the other chambers, but you can fight him. So, if you fight him and destroy him, you can then check out the other chambers. Would it even be worth it, I guess? Seems mean. So, if you go to the north, right? That's the hibernate. No, yeah, the north would be the hibernation chambers. This huge chamber has similar architecture as the Grand Hall, but is L-shaped. The ceiling slopes into a semicircular dome and has the same glowing translucent stone tiles. Along the floor are six-foot-long stone sarcophagi. The lids are pushed aside or laying on the tiled floor. Each lid is embedded with a smoky glass window about one foot square. The far side of the chamber appears to have suffered a cave-in and heavy boulders have fallen in and crushed or buried some sarcophagi. This is basically where the trogs came from. Um, there is a door that leads to other Titan ruins, heavily obscured, but it could be like an adventure hook, I'm guessing. So if you go to the south, right, that's the ruined so what so again no point really there he's he told you what was in there and you get nothing else unless you wanted an adventure hook area 15 is the ruined library the walls and semicircular dome ceiling of this chamber are covered in translucent glowing tiles but a portion of the room has been torn away leaving a jagged stone wall shelves like bookcases cover most of the walls and two ma massive cases lie in the corner the first shelf of these structures however begin 10 feet off the ground most of the shelves contain metallic discs so they're so high, it would be extremely difficult um, to get to them. There are 89 discs scattered around. So this would be, these platinum discs, this could be a big trouble. Um, like not, not, This could be worth the trouble because these are the discs of Norganon, which you do also gain access to in some of the other dungeons later on. It tells about the secret history of the Titans' war against the old god. Lots of people would do th things to get their hands on these discs. Um, so that is a big adventure hook. That's cool. This could be leading you into something else. And then finally the caved in chamber, you just can't do anything. All right. Concluding the adventure one way or another dwarves will eventually learn about the trog caves and the Titan ruins. And they're going to start sending excavations crews in there. Um, and uh, like we said, lots of adventure hooks could come. They could be. The, people could just they could just be hired to fight the centaur um if they're loyal to the horde they could go against the dwarves uh they could be entrepreneurs and compete against the dwarves they could cut a deal with the dwarves and be soldiers for them or if they're from the alliance they can work for the dwarves as delvers and get steady pay as a job that's it we have finished the Horde Player's Guide. So we have three books to go. We have the Lions Player's Guide, which is going to be a long, basically what we just read from the Alliance perspective. Um, we're going to have a Monster's Manual, which that one's going to be fast, I would imagine. We'll probably set, I'll probably set that one in chunks and just blaze through that one. Probably the whole book in, I don't know, from one to four episodes. That'll be a quick one. And then we have one a lands of whatever mystery or whatever it's called lands of something to fin to finish it out which is if it's anything like it's parallel 
It's going to be kind of short, but it'll probably have a decent amount of stuff like this one, just shorter in pages. Okay, we got another episode in the pipe, 5x5. Five five. Thank you, everybody, so much for watching and for listening. And I'll see you next time on Lore of Warcraft.